I remember seeing the house for the first time. I was seven years old. My parents had just bought their first home. I remember I used to hate living in the cramped, dingy apartment that we previously inhabited and opened the door to our new home with wide-eyed wonder. It blew my mind how spacious this house was. I went upstairs to scope out my bedroom. I was so excited that I was getting my own room and did not have to share a room with my little brother anymore. On my grand tour of my new house, I finally made it down to our basement. The basement was nothing like the rest of the house. The upstairs was elegant and classy. The basement was cold, metallic, and sterile. The ceiling covered in ancient pipes, winding in grotesque angles. The floor covered in rough cement. I recall taking a look at the stairs for the first time and being immediately struck with how odd they were. The stairs were surrounded in drywall, which clashed with the rest of the basement. One particular section of the wall was colored differently than the rest. It stood out like a sore thumb. I inched closer and felt the texture of it. It felt very strange. I then knocked on it. A hollow sound pervaded the empty air of the basement. Something about that sound immediately bothered me. I walked up the stairs as I could hear the same hollow sound echo in the emptiness of the basement. As we settled into our new home, I began to get comfortable with my surroundings. The house began to feel familiar. Everywhere, that is, except for the basement. It just always put me off, and I avoided going down there as best as I could. Our family couldn't be happier. My loving father and mother doted over me and my little brother. My life was perfect. Then, it began. I would hear strange noises. When I pointed it out to my parents, they told me that the house was just settling in. One night in particular indicated that something wasn't right. I snuck downstairs to the kitchen for a late night snack. As I closed the refrigerator, I heard a tapping sound cut through the silence of the night. I craned my head to see if I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from. Dread began to wash over me as I realized the tapping was coming from the basement. I inched my way over to the basement door. I opened it to see the blackness of the depths below. My ears perked up. There it was again, that hollow tapping sound, the same sound I had heard on my initial visit to the basement from hitting the drywall. I turned on the lights so that I could go downstairs and investigate. The tapping continued as I took the first step. Fear overtook me. I ran back to my room and hid under my covers until the morning light gave way to a new day. I remember walking down the stairs. Being the first one up and about, I ran to the living room to play Nintendo. On my way, I passed the door to the basement. It was shut. Though I was in a state of near panic when I ran from it the previous night, I distinctly remember leaving the door open and not turning off the lights. I rationalized that my mother or father must have gone down there for some reason. Later, I mentioned the incident to my parents, and they just assured me that what I heard was the sound of the hot water heater clicking in the night. I knew better, but welcomed a logical explanation. About a month after the move, my mother asked me to run downstairs and grab a load of socks, as our washer and dryer were in the basement. I reluctantly told her that I would. It was the middle of the day, and enough time had passed to dull the fear I had felt a week prior. I turned on the lights and ran downstairs, hearing the hollow sound echo with my footsteps. A cold sweat started to form on me. I made my way to the dryer and grabbed a basket. I pulled the socks out hastily and shoved them into the basket. After I shut the door to the dryer, I surveyed my surroundings. The stillness of the basement was so eerie. Then, I heard it. A faintly audible whisper. At first, I thought it was somebody calling from upstairs, and their voice scarcely making it down into the basement. However, this was not the case. That sound was coming from the basement. Specifically, from under the stairs. 
As I stood frozen with fear, it began to increase in volume, but still remained barely above the threshold of human perception. What was being said incomprehensible to my young ears. Then it stopped as quickly as it began. I moved towards the stairs, keeping my eye on the oddly colored portion of the drywall. As I took my first step to escape this ever-growing nightmare, the most profoundly terrifying moment of my life occurred. A loud, hollow bang shook the stairs, almost knocking me to the ground. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me. Through tears and shaking uncontrollably, I told my parents what happened. They tried their best to calm me down, but nothing they said could ease my mind. I told them in no uncertain terms that I would never go down to the basement again. They must have been convinced of how terrified I was because they honored my request and never sent me down there again. After another three months in the house, things returned to normalcy for me. And honestly, there was about a two week period where I was happy again. The last time happiness would exist in my life or my family's for that matter. One moment in particular comes to mind. I remember lifting up little Jonathan above my head lovingly as his pacifier fell out of his mouth and brushed against my nose, tickling me. I pulled him in for a big bear hug and remember how he smelled. That wonderful smell that babies emit and, for the last time, feeling content. Any semblance of contentment came crashing down for me and my parents the night of July 2nd, 1991. That is the day that Jonathan went missing. A ransom note was scrawled in barely legible English and left in his bed, demanding $20,000 cash. It informed my parents that if they contacted the police, they would kill Jonathan. My mother and father took to their room and argued loudly and emotionally over whether or not to call the police as I listened with tears streaming down my eyes. My mother eventually wore down my father and the police were called. Seeing as the location of the drop and time were indicated on the note, the police set up a wiretap just in case the kidnapper decided to call. I asked my parents and the police if they had thoroughly searched through the house in case he was still here. They assured me that they had, and that Jonathan would be fine after the drop, but the seed of an idea was already growing in my mind that would blossom throughout the rest of my life. My parents followed the instructions to a T. They dropped off the money and then waited in the location that they were supposed to pick up Jonathan. He never came. Needless to say, this tore my family apart. As the weeks passed, there was no news about Jonathan. My young, vibrant parents became husks of their former selves. My mother especially. She blamed herself for getting the police involved and believed that to be the reason Jonathan was not returned. One night, as she was sobbing alone in shambles, clutching a bottle of wine, I finally decided to divulge to her my theory that had been brewing inside my skull. I told her that I thought it was whoever, or whatever for that matter, was under the stairs that had gotten Jonathan, and maybe he is still alive. She slapped me across the face so hard that I saw stars. She screamed at me, the guilt expressing itself as rage. She told me to stop the childish bullshit and just accept that Jonathan was taken out of the house by a demented person and is dead. My childhood died that day. I remember contemplating taking a hammer and exposing whatever was under the stairs myself, but the fear was just too overwhelming for me to actually do it, let alone step one stair down into that basement. My family moved shortly after this incident. I remember looking to the future with what might resemble optimism only to have it come crashing down. My parents divorced. The grief was too much to share, and not a year after that, my mother killed herself. The guilt must have just overwhelmed her. My father did his best to raise me, but Jonathan's long shadow always hung over our lives. Twenty years later, 
I began to think long and hard about my little brother's disappearance and how angry it made me. My family had a chance at a normal and fulfilling life, and it was snuffed out in an instant by whoever took him. I wasn't just robbed of a little brother, I was robbed of any chance of happiness. As I grew up, I accepted the official story of what happened. But lately, curiosity began to get the better of me. I began driving past the old house, seeing that it was currently vacant. Ideas began to swirl in my head. So, I broke into the house, bolstered by alcohol. I decided to do it, knowing I would likely find nothing under the basement stairs, but hoping that this would close a too long chapter in my life and allow me to finally move on. To my dismay, the stairs sounded exactly the same as I remember they did. A hollow sound pervading the emptiness of the basement. I stare at the spot in the drywall, still discolored, still just as ominous as when I was a child. However, fear was not going to stop me. In fact, I was feeling the opposite. I was feeling a courage I hadn't felt in a long time. The moment of truth was upon me. With all the force within me emboldened by years of pent-up rage, I ran toward the wall shoulder first. The drywall came crashing down around me. I opened my eyes as my bravery was immediately eroded and turned into absolute horror. Bones. Bones everywhere. My horror increased to unimaginable heights as I surveyed the tight space seeing the skeletons everywhere, the light playing menacingly on their tiny frames. Tattered pieces of paper were everywhere with God only knows what written on them. There must have been the remains of 20 to 30 children when I realized that with no exceptions, they were all missing their skulls. One particularly tiny one begged for my attention. I became weak in the knees and fell backwards when I saw what were unmistakably bite marks up and down the tiny forearm. As I hit the ground, I expected to hear a dull thud as I landed on the concrete. Instead, I heard a hollow sound. I looked to see what I had landed on. A trap door. Finding new courage, summoning strength I didn't know I had, I opened it. Below me lay a dark tunnel, a crawl space that could barely fit a person lying on their stomach. The dank smell wafting upward made me reluctant, but I knew what I had to do. Before I was conscious of what my muscles were doing, I found myself crawling through the darkness toward whatever lay on the other side. As I reached the end of the tunnel, I looked up to see a sliver of light cutting through the darkness. I pushed upwards. Cautiously, I poked my head up. To my surprise, the tunnel had led to the other side of the stairs. I crawled out to find myself in the corner of the basement, facing the stairs behind a dryer covered in years of dust. The implications of all of this sent my mind reeling, but before I could form a coherent thought, the lights turned off in the basement. My heart caught in my throat as I began to hear someone descending the stairs, slow but sure steps announcing I was no longer alone. With every thud, my heart skipped a beat. I began to hear that incomprehensible whispering in my mind the familiar sound reigniting the fear and woe of my lost childhood. Worrying the darkness would not adequately hide me, I sought cover by ducking behind the dryer, not willing to take the risk of catching a glimpse, though every fiber of my being screamed at me to do so. Panic began to set in. What am I going to do when this person discovers their lair has been revealed? While I was mulling over my options, the screaming began. I say scream as a frame of reference, but there is no way to truly describe the guttural noises that I heard. The sounds smashing the silence of the basement were so bone-chilling, so surreal as to defy description. He clearly had discovered his perverse sanctuary had been disturbed. Before I knew it, I was up the stairs running for my life. I made it to my car too scared to turn around. 
With all muscles working in unison, I opened the door and put the key in the ignition in one swift movement. As my car sprang to life under the streetlight, a shadow fell over my car. I gunned it, never looking back, flooring the accelerator to the local police precinct. I breathlessly tried to explain to the attending officer what had occurred and collapsed to the floor mid-sentence. Now, it is a month later. The next day after my discovery, the police launched an investigation and quickly made the same gruesome discovery. I was thanked profusely by the police and the community for what I had found, telling me that they were going to be able to close the books on multiple missing person cases. However, they were not able to find the perpetrator of these heinous crimes. They began to test the DNA of the bodies. A profound sense of relief overcame me when I received the call informing me that one of the tiny skeletons belonged to Jonathan. I shared the news with my father, the look on his face, relief all-encompassing as the burden he had carried for so many years was lifted. We hugged as tears filled both of our eyes. However, the relief has been short-lived. The thing that keeps me up at night is that whoever or whatever did this is still out there. The question that plagues my mind is whether or not this monster is literal or figurative. Either way, I hope I never find out. Seven years ago, I was on my way home after getting off work late one night. I was sitting at a red light at an intersection, trying to keep my eyes open. I was extremely tired, but was right around the corner from my house. My eyes scanned around the empty intersection I was sitting at, and there was nobody around. Just as I pressed the gas pedal, I glanced in all of my mirrors, and about fainted when I thought I saw a face in my rearview mirror. My sleepy eyes jolted wide, and I hit the brake in the middle of the intersection. I stared into the rearview mirror, but didn't see anything. I turned around as much as I could and scanned the back seat. Nothing. I made it home a couple minutes later and quickly went inside. I first walked to my bedroom, put my cell phone on my bed, and put my work boots in my closet, and then walked back out to my living room. I peeked through the blinds and saw a man sitting in my back seat. I've never felt any fear like this before. It felt like all of my blood left my body and ice water began flowing through my veins. I ran back to my room and grabbed my phone. As I was dialing 911, I ran back to the living room window. The back door of my car was open and the man was gone. I slept at my brother's house that night. My childhood home was in a small town in Indiana. It was a beautiful blue Dutch colonial home in a neighborhood lined with huge old pine trees. Our house had been built in the 1800s and I always had a sense that there was something wrong about it. The neighborhood was filled with kids my age, and all of the families got together for summer block parties. Pretty idyllic. The only bad thing about our neighborhood was that at the end of the cul-de-sac was the town's hospital. Our hospital kind of looked like a brick version of Hogwarts. It wasn't too bad, except that the parking lot and entrance for the emergency room essentially backed up to several of our backyards. Every once in a while we would be woken up by an ambulance. On special occasions, a helicopter would land behind our house to fly a patient to Indianapolis or Cincinnati, and the adults would bring the little kids out in our pajamas to watch it land and take off. Kind of morbid, I realize. Other than the noise and bustle of the emergency room, we rarely noticed the hospital. Sometimes we would tell ghost stories about the people who died in the hospital and how they wandered our neighborhood in the afterlife. 
One night in early January, several inches of snow had fallen in a few hours. As a second grader, I was looking forward to the prospect of a snow day and stayed up later than normal. I finally fell asleep and all was quiet. The snow even muffled the ambulances that came in and out that night. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up. You know when you hear something in your sleep and it wakes you up? It was one of those instances. I sat up but heard nothing at first. I didn't see any light from under my parents' bedroom, so I knew they were asleep. I laid back down to try to fall back asleep when the noise that had woken me up came again. It's a noise that still haunts me. It was a low moan, like somebody quietly sobbing. I was perfectly still, trying to make sure I was hearing a human. Indeed, I was. The low moan turned into a sad, Help me. Over and over. I could tell it was coming from downstairs, so I snuck out of bed. My bedroom was at the top of our staircase, and looking down it, I could see right out the back door and onto our back deck. I could see several inches of snow blown up against the glass sliding door. The moaning continued, and I was convinced it was downstairs. I crept to the top of the carpeted stairs and hunched down to listen. As soon as I hunched down, I saw her. There was a woman standing at our back door. Her hair was frozen from the snow, and she was wearing a hospital gown. Her tears were frozen on her cheeks. She was barefoot. She looked right through the door and up at me, and I froze. Her moaning got louder, and I felt like it would shatter the glass sliding door. She began to pull at her gown and a bandage on her arm. When she finally looked away from me, I felt like I could move again, and I bolted. I ran to my dad and woke him up, crying that a woman was standing at our back door in the snow. He ran to the stairs, saw the woman, and immediately called 911. It turns out a patient in the dementia wing had gotten out, barefoot and lost, and she had found her way to our house. The orderlies quickly came and got her. I don't know if she lived much longer after that. She had to have had hypothermia. After that, we tried to avoid the hospital. Even though my family moved from that home several years later, on a particularly cold and snowy night, I sometimes still have dreams of that woman. She was terrifying. A few years back, I remember coming home late from work one evening. I was really tired and just went straight to the couch and watched some TV. It was very late and my eyelids got increasingly heavy. I turned off the TV and distinctly remember all the sleep mode lights on the various electronics that are hooked up to the TV. I also distinctly remember the way the street light was shining through the blinds. I closed my eyes for what seemed like a few seconds, and when I opened them, everything was exactly the same. I tried to move to get into a more comfortable position, but noticed that I could not move, and I instantly freaked out. My heart was pounding as I tried moving every part of my body, but couldn't. I tried to scream and yell for help, but nothing would come out. I was terrified and felt helpless. It was a very strange and scary feeling. My mind was racing as I was trying to figure out why I was paralyzed and if this was something permanent or if I needed serious medical attention. As I was freaking out, I also heard feet pattering in the hallway behind me. I was thinking maybe it was my younger sister. The pattern of the footsteps were consistent with that of a smaller child. I was beginning to feel relief that someone, which I thought was probably my little sister, would come and help me. Then, at that very moment, I realized that my younger sister would have no business being up that late at night, and she would have been way too terrified to be walking around in the basement not knowing if anyone was down there without any lights on. I realized that the footsteps were not my sister, 
and became even more terrified and confused by it all. As I remember, the fear was so overwhelming that I actually think it shocked my body for a moment, and it felt like it helped me regain movement in my toes and part of my back. The footsteps were quickly pattering down the hall, literally right behind my head, and back down the hall again. As I was panicking, I was able to use the partial movement of my back to scoot to the end of the couch, and I fell onto the floor laying on my stomach, with my face placed in the direction of the footsteps. I was still unable to move, and I began to hear the footsteps coming down the hall, again. I was in a state of disbelief and complete terror as I heard each footstep getting closer and closer down the hallway. Finally, as the footsteps reached the end of the hallway around the corner of the wall, I saw what I can only describe as a little bizarre shaped creature. Maybe two and a half to three feet tall, it was under a white sheet so I couldn't see what it really looked like and it was casually walking down the hallway. It had a very strange, unsteady gait. The creature then stopped and turned directly towards me and stared at me for a few seconds. It reminded me of a smaller version of E.T. when it goes trick-or-treating in the ghost costume for Halloween. It just looked awkward and not human with a weird, flat head, but not knowing what was under the sheet was what made it more scary in its own right. The creature suddenly jerked its arms up and began waddling with intensity towards my face. I was trying to scream and desperately trying to escape, but I could only lay there motionless and helpless. I really thought I was going to die, or at the very least sustain serious and permanent damage. It was simply pure horror and shock. Right as the creature was seemingly about to attack my face, I woke up and I was in the exact same spot I was in before. The sleep mode lights and street light beaming into the basement all looked the same. I was so confused and very disturbed. After researching, I found that I was experiencing an episode of sleep paralysis. The dreams are easily mistaken for reality. It's almost like a hallucination, and it was so much different than any dreams I've ever had. I will never forget that night, and I hope to never experience it again. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like telling the story, since it was actually true, but we pressured her to do so. To cut to the chase, the parents had spent a nice first date, and around the time that they would have said goodnight, the male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place, since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up to the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking under just the light of the stars, since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling, since the pathway ahead, which would pass under some trees, would be dark, and because it was getting to be quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. In later tellings of the story, the female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she didn't know the trail like he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees, it was too dark to see just what this soft thing was, and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with the serial killer Ted Bundy. In response to a question, asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail. He explained how he hid in the trees just in time 
only to watch some guy walk right into the body and then for some reason just turned around and walked away. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at my school. One day, she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all-night study session, which she had known about, and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going to go back to her place, and then I never heard anything from her ever again. After three days of texting her, trying to make sure she was okay, the text started coming back as number not found. I sent her the stuff she'd left at my apartment in the mail, and it returned as no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I never used but knew the name of it, was disconnected. And it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates. They didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings for me just to make sure she was alive. The school she was at didn't have any records of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone. None of our mutual friends ever saw her again I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in the stretch of road between our two schools that night, or in the two weeks after. I didn't ask for a longer time frame, because at that point she was already missing. The cops wouldn't file a missing persons report, because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened to her, why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive in a witness protection program, she literally disappeared without a trace. I was going to make a throwaway, but what the hell, I'll take the risk of looking like a totally insane person. No one is going to believe me anyway. This happened when I was 17. I'm 32 now. I graduated high school and got my first apartment in a nice town. I lived by myself other than my cat, Snowball. Don't laugh, I named her when I was 8 years old. A few details before we get started. I've never been a fan of cat boxes. Worst part of being a cat owner is shoveling tiny shit with a tiny shovel every day. So I got one of those motion-activated self-scooping deals, left it on the back patio, ran the cord inside to power it, and left the back sliding door open big enough for her to get in and out. It was about 5 to 6 inches. The patio was one of those 8x8 cement floor types surrounded by a 5 foot tall wooden fence. If you looked out from my bedroom door, you'd be facing right at the sliding door with hanging blinds living room in between, and the kitchen that was off to the right. So I'm playing video games at the computer in my room, with my back facing the door. It's about 1 a.m. I hear Snowball start to make one of those awful cat growling noises in the back of her throat. I'm pretty locked into the game, so I tell her to knock it off, not looking at her. She keeps doing it. I tell her to shut up. I'm irritated because I'm doing well in the round. She gets loud. This is enough to break me from my gaming zone out, and I realize that this is not normal. I get up from my computer to see her standing in the doorway facing out, her back to me. She is in full-on Halloween cat mode, hair sticking straight out. Her back is completely arched. She looks tense. I'd never seen her that way. She is still just going crazy. I look out into the living room where she is facing. Nothing is amiss. There is nothing there. I look down at her to say something to the effect of, What's the matter? She makes this insane sound, like a combination of a hiss, a growl, 
and a spit, and she starts to take a few steps backwards. That is when a tiny creature runs out of the kitchen on two legs, wearing a tattered piece of cloth or a bag. It looked like a little cloak. It's maybe a foot or a foot and a half tall. It was a real life jump scare. The cat jumps backwards about three feet in the air. I jump. I glance down at her as she does this but quickly look back up. I hear her land with a crash behind me and then run. I am fixated on this thing. It is moving, but it's like time has slowed down. I am watching these things happen, but everything is so fast. It runs out the back door through the blinds with a crash at speeds that don't even seem natural. The blinds are swinging. My heart is pounding. I stand there dumbfounded. What the hell did I just see? I'm staring at the back patio door at the swinging blinds. I'm not moving. My eyes start to notice that something is wrong. All the blinds are softly swinging except the two closest to the opening. I see they're making an inverted V. I look at them and follow them down to the very bottom, and between them, I see it. Its head is poking through the blinds staring at me. It has yellow eyes and a face that I can only describe as bestial, gray, greenish, with blackish skin. At this point, a singular loud thought fills my mind. You aren't supposed to see this. And at the conclusion of that thought, every one of the hanging blinds shoots upward and outward. I jump again, and my heart tries to blast out of my chest. Some of them hitting the ceiling. A few fall off. It's a loud racket. The rest are swinging all over the place. I look at the place where its face was, and it's gone. I beeline for the kitchen. Refrigerator door is open. I open a drawer and grab the biggest knife that I see. I am shaking. Adrenaline like I have never experienced before. I rush to the sliding door and slam it shut. It won't close. I open it a bit and slam it back shut. Still won't close. What the hell? I am completely stupid. The cat box cord. I crouch down, brandishing this knife like a complete idiot looking out the glass door waiting for this thing to launch at my face. I'm shaking. I reach across myself with my left hand to the power plug on the wall to the right as I stare out, waiting to stab anything that approaches. I fumble to get it unplugged. My hands won't do anything right. I finally get the cord unplugged, and I open the door real quick to throw the cord outside. I throw it like a spaz, and it hits the wall in the side of the door and falls down, still inside. Damn it. I pick it up and try again. This time it lands outside. I hear a scratching sound and my eyes dart up. I see two tiny, awful hands holding onto the fence. Clawed, humanoid hands. This thing climbed down feet first, hanging from the fence. It would have been slightly comical if it wasn't so terrifying. The hands let go, and I hear it land in the bushes outside the fence, and I hear fast footsteps as it runs off. I slam the door shut and lock it. This is completely true. I've heard it all. It was a raccoon. It was a cat. It was not either of those things. After the event, I started researching like a madman. The closest thing I found was in a book I found at the library called Fairies, which is like an art book featuring all the different types of Irish folk creatures. I don't live in Ireland. I live in the U.S. on the West Coast. You don't believe this story, and I don't blame you. It sounds ridiculous. You probably shouldn't believe it. I hate bullshit paranormal stories. Believe it or not, I am a skeptic. I believe all people that have experienced something strange or believe in the paranormal should be a skeptic. I enjoy debunking paranormal videos and pictures. I want the truth. Was I hallucinating? It's entirely possible I had an extreme and sudden hallucination. It's not unheard of. This event had a huge impact on my life and completely affected the way I view the world. The paranormal. Religion. Everything.
I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut was all two-lane road through total nothingness, except for passing through Amboy, California. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley, with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also, at the time, a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign just to prove that I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to I-40. I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I am driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fiero stopped sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies lying face down in the road, a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it were staged. An ambush? Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was the horror movie move. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive, past the guy in the road on his left, swerve to the right side of the woman behind the Fiero, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line that I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet, and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and the bodies. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 East on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Somehow I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. From an early age, I loved hearing scary stories. When I was first learning to read, I worked very hard in school. My teachers thought I was trying to be a good student. The truth is, I wanted to be able to read even more scary stories on my own. My mom recognized this obsession and would often share her own creepy tales. If a storm took the power out, she would light a few candles and tell me about the frightening, weird, and sometimes baffling experiences she had growing up. Many of the stories were about her old home, which she suspected was haunted. As much as I loved these tales, sometimes the ones that were completely free of paranormal elements scared me the most. My mom had grown up in a dangerous neighborhood. Many of her stories were simply about the truly frightening people she encountered during her childhood. A story about a ghost is scary to a child. A story about a living person who wants to harm you for absolutely no reason was even more unnerving. It communicated a truth about the world that I could never completely forget once I had learned it. The world can be a dangerous place. The people in it aren't always good. A normal evening can become a descent into fear at any moment. And sometimes, the only thing standing between you and true horror is a locked kitchen door. This story in particular has always managed to rob me of my sleep. My mom was home with her sisters one night. There were six of them in total, along with a brother who was out of the house at the time. 
My grandmother wouldn't be home from work for several hours. My grandfather had already passed away at this point. Although some of the older sisters were teenagers, they were all young enough to feel vulnerable and alone that evening. There had been a fire in the house a few weeks earlier. It damaged a large portion of one of the walls, making it very easy for an intruder to get in. Because they lived in a bad neighborhood, my mom and my aunts spent the evening together in the kitchen, with the door to the adjoining hallway locked. They didn't have much that anyone might want to steal, but they also knew that people break into homes for other, far worse reasons. Besides the door to the hallway, there was no way to get out of the kitchen. The room was essentially landlocked. In other words, they were trapped. Unfortunately, because of the fire damage, the kitchen was the safest room in the home at that time. It wasn't an ideal spot, but it was the best place to gather until someone older got home. My mom and her sisters were chatting, waiting for my grandmother to get back from work, when they noticed something strange. The handle on the hallway door was turning, as if someone was trying to get into the kitchen. They asked if someone was there, but got no response. Still, the person kept twisting at the doorknob. This went on for several minutes. In a vain attempt to scare the intruder away, my mom and her sisters pretended that they were having a big party. They made a lot of noise, hoping they might trick the person in the hallway into thinking that there was a much bigger, older group of people in the kitchen. At first, it seemed like the trick might have worked. The handle did eventually stop moving. For a brief moment, everyone thought the danger was gone. Sadly, this was not the case. The sound of someone trying to open the door may have stopped, but it was soon replaced with another sound. Click, 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 click. At first, no one could figure out what it was. They only knew it was coming from the hallway. It took a few moments for them to realize that whoever was behind the door was now switching the hallway light on and off. Somehow, that was scarier than someone trying to get in. There was no reason for this person to switch the light on and off like that, but they kept doing it. Clearly, they were now just taunting my mom and her sisters. The fact that they never said a word just made it that much more terrifying. My aunt called the police, but the police were notoriously slow in that neighborhood. There was simply too much crime for them to respond quickly. After calling the police, she called a neighbor and asked them to come to the house. Understandably, the neighbor was just as frightened by the thought of this intruder as they were. He went over to the front door and shouted for them to come out. It was a small house, but he would not go in. He thought he might be able to scare the intruder off by making it clear that an adult was waiting for everyone outside. He was wrong. All throughout this experience, the noise never stopped. Click, 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 click. My mom and aunts finally had enough. They needed to get out of that room somehow. Every sister grabbed a knife, and they all lined up at the hallway door, from oldest to youngest. That was one of the few times my mom was happy to be the youngest of seven children. After a moment, they opened the door to the hallway and charged into it. They hoped they might scare the intruder away, but their main goal was simply to get out of the house. When they entered the hallway, the light was off. The sun had fallen by that point, so the entire hallway was dark. That's probably for the best. No one truly wanted to see the person who had been taunting them all evening. More importantly, they didn't want the person to get a good look at them. However, my Aunt Nora, the oldest of the sisters, did see something. The outline of a dark figure running down the hall and up the stairs. She didn't take any time to stop and confront this figure. Instead, she and all the others ran out of the house. They spent the rest of that evening out front, waiting for the police and my grandmother. Eventually, the police did arrive. They searched the home, but whoever broke in was gone. Everyone agreed that the person must have entered and exited the house through the fire damage section. 
They never caught the intruder. It could have been a random lunatic. It could have been someone they saw every day. This person might have just been passing through the area, or they might have been stalking my mom and her sisters, watching them for weeks. Not knowing who had broken in that night was frightening, and yet, not knowing why this person decided to spend an evening tormenting six young girls with something as simple as a noise was even worse. I love reading your stories, so I thought I would include one of my own. I'm still not sure what happened at this house in Germany, but I'm very, definitely sure that it happened. My wife and I were married in April of 1972, and at the same time, I was reassigned to duty on Schembach Air Base in Schembach, Germany. By the winter of 1973, we had rented a beautiful house from a wonderful couple named Carl and Alfreda Jacob. This house was located in Schulstrasse, Munchweiler, Germany. This was just a few miles from Sembach Air Base and was generally located in the south of Germany, near Kaiserslautern. At the time we lived there, the house was 160 years old. I am sorry that we lost in touch with Carl and Alfreda. They were some of the nicest people I have ever known. As far as that goes, we were the only Americans living in this village, and the people there were top-notch, and we lived a quiet existence. Our first child, a boy, was born while we lived there. His coming seemed to manifest a presence that my wife and I really were not aware of at first. There had been a few noises and such, but we really didn't think much about it. Sometimes... It would feel as though we were being watched. As our son grew though, the first few months of life, there were many concerns, and this is only one of them. As time goes by, I will relate stories that happened in the house, but the one I will tell you now concerns something without. The baby was about six or seven months old. As babies of that age sometimes do, he was crying and seemed to want to. My wife was letting him cry it out for a little while. He was in our bedroom in the crib. Our bedroom was on the back side of the house, and there was a small walkway besides the house and a concrete wall. The backyard was on the side of the hill, and the ground was at the top level of that wall, just about even with the bedroom window. The walkway was less than two feet wide. The house had upstairs bedrooms, but we hardly ever used them. From the backyard, one had to go down some steps beside our bedroom and then open an arched door in the eight foot high brick wall to reach the front yard. We were blessed to have grass and this was outside passage from the front to the back. The arched door was wrought iron covered with pixaglass and had an iron dead bolt door that latched it close. Once in the front yard, there was a wrought iron fence at the street and the yard itself was about two and a half feet higher than the street and the fence was about four feet higher. Our neighbors to the right were the last house before the trail up to the woods, and the backside both of our houses was open to the fields. My landlady had instructed us that it is very important that we close and lock the wooden shutters over all our windows and lock the deadbolt outside the gate every night. It was dark, at around nine o'clock, when the baby was crying and we heard something in the backyard, outside our bedroom window. Whatever it was, it was making an eerie sound, mimicking the baby crying. Whatever it was, it was big. We could hear it drawing breath into its lungs and wailing with a sound that would chill you right up to your spine. Standing in the backyard, by the window, it was probably about two feet away from the shutters. I had no gun, being a foreigner in Germany. The thing that bothered me and frightened me most we listened to it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I finally decided that I would wake up with my bowie knife and throw open the storm shutters and attack it. My yelling at it through the open window and through the wooden shutters had no effect on it. 
We then decided that giving it access to the house in this fashion was not a good idea. I then thought that I would go out to the front, since we had no back door, and go around the house and take it on brute. My wife didn't want me to go out, but I found out later that she just didn't want to be in the house alone. Like I said, the thing was big by its sound. Its wail was a high sound, almost a scream. And in between screams and wails, we could hear low guttural growls similar to that of a lion or a big cat. I finally exclaim that I'm going out, we need some relief. I grab my knife and headed out for the door. I also took a hiking staff with a metallic pointed end. It took two full turns of the giant skeleton T to get the door open. By this time, I had redirected my fear to an attack attitude and was prepared to jolt the damn thing like it was doing to us. Just as I opened the front door, I could see the thing coming out beside our house. It looked like a wolf. It was just jet black and had long, coarse looking fur. It was just over three feet high at the shoulder. It glanced at me and ran across the front yard, about 50 or 40 feet, and leapt over the wrought iron fence. As it landed on the sidewalk, it took off at a run and disappeared past my neighbor's house and up the track to the woods. I walked around the house and into the backyard. The wrought iron door stood agape. To this day, I have yet to figure out how the thing opened the wrought iron door deadbolt. When I was 18, so in about 2006, my friend and I decided to take a cruise to celebrate becoming adults. The type of cruise we choose to take had a lot of alcohol, food, and a lot of cute guys. One night, I couldn't sleep. My friend passed out cold and I, for the life of me, just couldn't drift off to sleep. I decided to go out to the deck and have a cigarette and take a walk to hopefully tire myself out. I found my headphones, cigarettes, and lighter and left the room quickly. The halls were deserted, which didn't surprise me as it was 3 a.m. So I put my headphones in and blasted my favorite band at the time, Mariana's Trench, and walked out of the hall to the upper deck. I felt an eerie feeling and looked back feeling like someone was watching me. The hair on my neck stood up. I turned around quickly, but no one was behind me. I kind of laughed at myself and said, okay, Mandy, get it together. I walked up to the deck that was also deserted, and so I found a spot on a bench closer in front of the ship and sat down. I lit a cigarette and stared out at the ocean. As I smoked my cancer stick, for a few minutes focusing on the reflection of the moon on the water, I suddenly felt someone sit beside me. I look over instinctively, and a guy about 40 or so was sitting beside me. I didn't want to talk to a stranger, so I looked back at the water. The guy beside me suddenly yanked out my earbud. I looked at him annoyed and said, What the hell? You're pretty, he told me. Um, thank you, I replied awkwardly. Are you here alone? he asked. He moved closer as he did this. No, I told him feeling anxious. With your boyfriend? he asked. I looked at him and my gut told me to lie, and I said, Yeah, he's sleeping. He gave me a creepy side grin. Pretty girl like you. If you were my girlfriend, I'd be making these waves rock. He joked with a laugh. I looked at him horrified. My name's Muhammad, he told me, inching closer again. I didn't respond. Instead, I put my earbuds back in, hoping that he would get the hint. Then I continued to smoke my cigarettes. A few seconds later, he yanked my earbud out again, and this ball scared and pissed me off. I stood up quickly. Do you like wine? He asked. I have wine in my room. You should join me for a glass. At this point, I was freaked out completely. No, I don't drink wine and I don't know you. Please leave me alone, I told him sternly. So angry, he said with a chuckle. You need someone to clear that up for you. I started to walk away and head back to my room, and I got about three steps away when he grabbed my left wrist and stopped me. Before I could say anything, he grabbed me and held me in a huge hug. You smell so good, he said. I pulled away violently. I was able to get far enough away from him that I could run quickly inside. A security guard must have heard me scream because as I reached the door to get back inside, he let me in and stopped. 
I was crying from fear and he asked me if I was okay. I managed to choke out what had happened and he told me to stay inside as he rushed outside to deal with John. A few minutes later he came back inside and told me there was no man on the deck and that he may have gone back to his room. He had me fill out a report and give a detailed description of my attacker and then he escorted me back to the room. The next morning I told my friend about what happened and she made me agree not to go out on deck alone anymore. She didn't have to tell me twice. The rest of the cruise I was on edge, but I didn't see John again. The weird thing is is that there was no Muhammad listed on the ship and no ma'am watching his description was ever found according to the security guard who took my report. A few co-workers tried to find this man as I didn't want him harassing any other woman. This scares me because I know how it happened and I know he smelled and how greasy he seemed. I'm in the United States Coast Guard and used to be stationed in Oregon, where I'm actually from. Being on the Pacific, there's trials and tribulations that your average human being would break down at the thought of. We once rescued the broken body of a three-year-old little girl whose mother threw her off the bridge because of her schizophrenia. I've pulled out more waterlogged corpses out of the ocean than I care to admit, but someone has to do it. The city where I was stationed is in steeped in local legend from ghostly figures standing on the massive bridge peering over the side like they're debating whether or not their ethereal body should take the plunge. Spoiler alert, if you're dead, then you jumped. Spirits on the boardwalk and hitchhiking specters are also pretty standard town lore. However, I have my own brush with the final calls for help from someone beyond the grave. Back in 2013, when I had first joined the Coast Guard, we got a mayday call from a sailing vessel that was making its way from San Diego to Seattle. This was in November. The coast was a breeding ground of bad weather and awful life choices, especially for sailboats, which were notorious along the west coast. So, like any good guardsman, we loaded up our motor lifeboats and headed towards the man with the now capsized vessel, a mere 10 nautical miles away from our bay. However, when we got there, there was nothing but debris a couple of coolers, a life ring, and some rigging that was only left to the side of the boat. Because of the incoming hurricane force, we had to turn around and head for home, vowing that we'd send helicopters and boats out as soon as the storm passed. However, we knew that his chances of survival were zipped to nil, since the waters were no more than about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. With heavy hearts, we turned around and headed back for the land. There's always that what if question in your head that makes you wonder, but at the end of the day, you don't know you can't go back in time. So, later that same evening, I'm sitting in our communication center, monitoring the marine band radios, talking with my boss and best friend. Suddenly, a voice comes over the radio, and to this day, typing it out or even thinking about it, gives me chills. Help, Mayday, I don't know where I am. The voice was so quiet and it sounded like it was coming from the bottom of a well. It didn't help that the storm was probably interfering with the radio. I picked back up, asking the vessel what his position and nature of distress was. There was never any response. My boss came into the room and replayed the message. Now, on our electronic chart, we can pull up the caller's position. And that's what he did. I watched his eyes grow wide with horror as he pointed at the chart. There was the sailboat's last known position before he had went down to the rest of the bottom of the ocean floor. I can say with certainty that this was the man's final cry for mercy before the Great Pacific swallowed him whole for the last time. We searched for this man for 72 hours with lifeboats, helicopters, and local police and fire departments and never found any sign of this man. I have been in the service for five years and this is still the scariest thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to the housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loud as we wanted. 
This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill, where all the surrounding houses were far enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors, and we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late, and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time, so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked outside our tent. I was stunned with terror, for one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer who would probably be angry to find us here, but more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent, and I couldn't see the dog's shadow, even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared, and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking outside of the tent, but with perpetually lighter footsteps. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quiet as possible, and said we had to go because someone knew we were here, and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, and they didn't believe me, thinking I had been asleep as well and dreamt the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't, and we had to go right now. They tried to go back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that I'd never get back to sleep. Ten minutes later, the sound returned, just like the volume outside had been turned up gradually. I felt the same dread I had before, and whispered to one of my friends' names. They woke up, and they were looking at me. Shh, I said. They had already started hearing the noises, and told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand outside the sleeping bag, and up the zipper. It probably took five minutes for me to reach it, just so I was sure not to make a sound. I pulled it up so violently that I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I mentioned, we were at the top of a hill in the middle of a field, so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anyone to escape my seeing them, I am absolutely positive there was footsteps outside our tent that night. I'm a geologist, working at Death Valley National Park in Nevada. Over the last few months, we've been studying the geological formation dubbed Devil's Hole. Anyway, I've always found this place somewhat disconcerting. We have a vague idea of how it came to be and what makes it do what it does, but there's something else. Something off. The other day, we sent a little submarine drone into the water to see if we could map out the labyrinth cave system we know is there. But, it has been completely inaccessible for decades. Also, we wanted to find out how deep it goes. The fact that an earthquake in China also could cause the water to rise so substantially at this spot in Nevada makes us think the water goes way deeper than preliminary estimates. The sub started to map the first 50 feet. It was tough to get a great signal. The mineral content of the water was really inhospitable to the system we use and how they communicate with one another. Not to mention the superheated water near the geothermal vents once you get more down. That could be enough to disable the drone entirely. At around 75 feet, the signal got really touchy. We'd have a few minutes of decent communication, but then it would cut out completely and leave us wondering if the sub had crashed or had been damaged beyond recovery. 
During the windows, when we would have time to move the drone, we explored from cave to cave and went deeper and deeper. The water was well above boiling as the pressure increased, so did the temperature. The sub was rated up for 400 degrees for a short period of time, and the pockets of water were getting close to that maximum. We got to a relatively cool spot, around 225 Fahrenheit, and we were told to stand by. Greg, the guy who was operating the optical equipment on the drone, kept insisting that he was seeing flashes of light way below our position. I kept insisting that the equipment was malfunctioning and causing the flashes. But Greg wouldn't shut up about another sensor registering bursts of heat at the same time of the flashes. We argued for a little while and the drone stayed in place. The water level in the hole started to rise. This wasn't unexpected. A surprisingly little amount of seismic activity anywhere in the world was enough to move the water over here. We kept bickering and didn't notice more flashes on the screen until much later when we analyzed the video. What finally knocked us out of our retrospective tantrums, though, was the way the water started to change color. It went from its normal shade of dull red, and Greg glanced at the screen and noticed the depth of the water in the cave chamber originally at 36 feet had changed to 353,000 feet. We knew there had to be an error. More flashes showed up on the screen as the water forthed and frothed and burbled on the surface. Then the feed went dead and stayed dead. Greg and I analyzed the video overnight. Everything we seen was there and was just as confusing. But then Greg saw a tiny spike in the audio track, right when the depth of the cave appeared to drop straight down. He ran it through a few filters to amplify the signal and clean it up. Then he played it back. We listened to it about 20 times in a row, despite hearing it perfectly the first time. Corresponding with the massive increase in death and last word of the message, there was one more flash in the final video frame before the drone was lost. After Greg cleaned it up, we saw that it was a single, glowing red light. Three years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to hike up near her parents' place in Oregon when we went to visit them for a week. We decided to bring camping gear and stay the night. I had only been camping once before and it was in Boy Scouts, so it had been a long time. My girlfriend grew up camping and knows her way around the area very well. So, myself, her and her parents' dog, Bear, a huge Newfoundland lab mix, headed up the trail. We saw a few people out, but they were mostly just day hikers. People loved Bear and stopped to pet him. So a little after six we made camp, set up our tent, and pulled out our grub. We had decided to buy big sub sandwiches, stuff for s'mores, chips, and a few tall boys of beer. I fired up a joint and she pulled out her guitar after we finished eating. Great relaxing night and we started winding down, getting ready to head to bed. She was in the tent getting dressed for bed while I was finishing the joint and making sure the fire was out. Suddenly, Bear growls this low menacing growl I've never heard him do before. I pet him and look around figuring it's an animal or something. We get to sleep at around 1. I wake up and my girlfriend is shaking. She looks terrified. I hear Bear growling beside us and she holds her finger up talking low. She tells me she woke up to voices. I listen and I hear what sounds like two men talking. Then we hear something absolutely terrifying. One of them says to his friend, I'll take the girl, you get rid of the guy. I knew we were screwed. We had no weapons of any sort. My girlfriend unzips the tent and Bear rockets out. I've never seen him move that fast in my life. I hear one of the guys yell, oh shit! And I hear Bear snarling and growling and I hear them running. My girlfriend takes the satellite phone and her dad insisted that we carry it and thank God, calls her dad. He calls law enforcement and they sent people out to there. They told us to stay in the tent. Bear comes back out of breath with no sign of the guys and we wait for the ranger. When they show up, they find no sign of the guys, save for truck tires and some cigarette butts. They gave us a ride back down to our car later that day. Bear got a steak and plenty of love. <laughs>